G'day guys, welcome to another episode of Queensland Abandoned Mines. I hope to get your subscription today if you like today's episode. Now if you're watching today, this is the third part uh, of a three-part series of Mount Shamrock Abandoned Gold Mines. So you need to jump back to the previous two Friday nights so you'll catch up where we're up to. There are a couple of awesome episodes. Enjoy today's episode. Welcome back everybody. And where I am now, I'm perched on the enormous mine dump pretty hazarded walking over this because there's never any soils in them. But the reason why I'm here, I'll probably have to zoom in on it on the video. I'm trying to line up this angle to show you guys where the old processing mill was. And I'll walk over there in just a sec, but just where my finger is there, there's the first settling tank, cyanide tank. And then it's a uh, same size one, about six feet below it. In the photo, they're actually side by side. Uh, there's one to the north and then one to the south. And uh, again, it's a bit hazardous, so I'll make my way over there and uh, show you guys what's left. We'll try and piece together where it's at. All right, so we're on the old miners trail here that sort of drives north to south. And uh, just trying to line that photo up. I'll give you guys a rundown on what I think was going on here. All of the waste is just down in the gully, just down to our north. I'll show that in one of the other episodes where there's that big landing down there. That's the huge rubble heap. But coming off this road here would have been the timber trommel. It would have been just this side of that remnants of that huge boiler. And you can see some of the old footings are still standing. Now, according to the landowner, right where I'm standing now is the location of the old Cornish boiler. Now, that thing is absolutely huge. Uh, the research we've done shows me that the uh, Cornish boilers were between four and seven metres. And this thing measures up at seven metres. So I'd say it's one of the biggest Cornish boilers ever built. Uh, but effectively all these bricks were around it but the bricks that eroded and become very very dangerous because the boiler was starting to get close to this edge so the property owners had to drop it down the hill but on with what we're looking at first this is the old footings from the old processing mill so like I said the the ore would have fed in through here gravity fed down into the mill the mill stood right on this block of land here and then what these footings are from is from a 20 head stamp mill. So it would have been a five head stamper. There would have been four of them. And they were running for a couple of years for 24 hours a day. And those things would have made an absolute racket. So there's one of the footings there. There's another one that's buried over there. That would have been the far Northern corner of the uh, processing mill. And I think the mill was still standing and maybe until the fifties. And then with fires and Queensland weather, it just got way too dangerous. So the boiler would have linked up to here. In the photo, you can actually see the old chimneys coming out, the old flumes coming out of the top of the uh, the top of the processing mill. So they would have fed that. That would have fed a flywheel, uh, and that would have linked to effectively a huge crank that would have driven all of these uh, stamp mills. Pretty cool. And I think one single uh, stamp. Uh, used to weigh about half a ton. That's why these footings used to be so uh, huge, so substantial. So I guess you've got five head of stamp, all the timber work. Uh, you know, you're probably looking at about a four or five ton machine. And then there was four of them here. So they've got to make sure they seat them pretty well. So the next step of the uh, processing here, done at Mount Shamrock, would have been to get that refined ore, that crushed ore, that comes out of the, uh, the stampers out of the mill and then they put them into these treatment ponds these are cyanide treatment tanks and uh, I believe cyanide leaching was introduced into Australia the exact same year that this mine was open which was around about 1887 and here's the second settling pond so I think at one stage these were side by side and I believe they've relocated one down to here and we've got the remnants of another boiler we're going to walk down to that in just a second, but down there is the huge seven metre Cornish boiler. Artifacts galore. It's actually walking this uh, property with one of the owners today. And I found an old um, hand chisel. It would have been late 1800s that he's let me keep. So that's going in the collection. I actually had all them to the rock garden out the uh, front of my house as ornaments. Uh, my wife absolutely hates them. Uh, we can't agree on that one. I reckon they look sick. Anyway, we've got a boiler here. That's only about probably a quarter of the size of the big ball that's lying down the bottom of the hill. 
So what we're going to go to now is to check that fella out, and then we've got a couple more mines uh, before we sign out from Mount Shamrock. Here she is, guys. This big old girl. This would have gone in around about late 1880, around 1890, and this would have been needed to uh, provide the much needed steam power to power the battery. Thanks to the uh, few of the crew members from the lads down in the Victorian Historical Mine Chasers group. Again, I always made the wrongful assumption that once they got this big, they'll repurpose from a locomotive. But this is custom made. So I believe this is a pretty powerful boiler. It's absolutely huge. Where these two little nails here are quite possibly where the engineering plate is gone. So same guys told me that it would have needed a serial number. That serial number would have been registered with the mines department and they would have come out for annual or biannual inspections to make sure that it was in good running order. And uh, I'll put up a photo of where this guy used to sit inside a little brick kiln. But again, it got too close to the edge of the old mill. So they had to roll it down the hill so it didn't kill any cattle. And apparently a uh, six ton tractor struggled to even get it moving in first gear. I'm not a farmer, but I'm just assuming that means this thing's bloody heavy. And uh, this thing used to max out at about 10 bars of pressure. And I think the only thing that superseded this was the uh, Lancaster boiler. It had twin fire pits, they were smaller. And as a result, I think they used to be able to get them up to 16 bar. Isn't it beautiful? Beautiful old boiler. All right, let's keep exploring, guys. I've still got two mines to show you. I do believe the next one's going to be a bit of a tight squeeze, so if you're claustrophobic, maybe just skip forward two minutes. I'll see you on the inside of that one. All right, guys, this one's going to be hard going. This is the part of the day that comes with a claustrophobia warning. Uh, it's only about as high as my boot, and uh, there is a billion midges. So if you don't like tight crawls, maybe uh, just skip ahead a few minutes till I'm on the inside. Oh, not gonna lie, that was pretty gross. That was a tiny little hole. All right, let's see what we got in here. We have one hell of an echo, and that goes back as far as my torch can see. Check that out. All right, I just gotta get my breath back for a bit. I'm already down to 18.5% oxygen. I've got it set for 16, so if this gets any worse, uh, it will arm and I'll get the hell out of here. All right, so what we're we on, guys, we're on the, um, this mine doesn't actually have a name, uh, but we're on another drive up into the mountain. This is another east to west running one. Um, so Kent's Knob is just to my uh, north, about 50 metres, and um, I'd say they were looking for the mother load, looking for the vein. They're into this mud rock again. Okay, I've got some animal droppings in here. All right, just give me a sec, guys. I've just got to check the air again because it's really funky in here. It's hot as hell. It's 32 degrees outside. It's maybe the same temperature in here, but it's about 1,000% humidity. Just give us a sec. I'll get ready and I'll be back with you guys. All right, let's see how far this bad boy goes. Had some water in here recently. I wish you guys had a... Uh, YouTube smell o vision and really like uh, you'd be on the journey with me. Whoa, sinky floor. That would give you guys the uh, full experience. Oh man, this goes away. There's one thing I'm really sus of, guys, it's wet mines. I was going to check my air again, I'm just going to check the air. Always got to check your air when the uh, opening to the mine is so small. If the portal's really open, ah, oh, wet feet. Oh, yeah, I've done it now, haven't I? Oh my god! If the portal's really open and it's easy to walk out of, and you hit dangerous air, I think I said in episode one of this uh, series of Shamrock, dangerous air is getting down into the um, into the 15s and 14s. So if you know you've got a little bit of a tight squeeze like I do, 
it's best not to push it. And as soon as your air meter goes off, have it set high and get the hell out of there. And if you've got to climb anything vertical in mine, and no, I'm not saying go out and do it. I advise my um, content never to do it. If you've ever got to climb, you'd really want your air meter set to about 18, 90. All right, this could be the first bit of inkling. It's going to be hard, but in the main shaft in Shamrock, maybe similar to the ge uh, geology in Gympie, when they hit these black slates that are away, and that is black slate, and it's all sort of mixed in with the mud rock. And just like in Gympie, if they could afford to keep driving these mines down, as soon as they hit those black slates, they were away. A little hedgehog is sleeping here. If he moves, I'm going to absolutely shit myself. You guys might think it's crazy I'm in a mine with bats, but... I'll try my best not to disturb the little fella. I actually just got to turn my headlamps down, guys. They're actually too bright. Yeah, that's a bit better, hey? Let's have a look at these slates. That's what they're after. And I think it's actually really hard to tell because there's all calcite and calcium that's come through, but there could be little stringers in amongst those slates as well. All right. Oh, it's getting low. Now I've got bats, and we've got a face. That was cool. Well, here we go, guys. This is epic. One of those black slates. We've come to the face, and we can see some stringers. Oh, I've got to keep my head down. They would mine that. Miners would go after little stringers of quartz if it had enough stuff in it. It was between a centimetre, and I mean, in Gympie, they were like six foot wide near the big faults, near the Inglewood faults. Yeah, actually, I'll follow this little stringer with my torch and then I've got to get out of here and check my air. It is so gross in here. And I'm not looking forward to climbing out. I'll follow this little stringer up for you. There you go, so it bellies out a bit there. It's probably about three to four centimetres thick. And it goes right up through the ribs, right up above my head. And you can actually see some like iron staining in there. That's what they would have been chasing. Oh. It's hot. Well, what I might do, I'm probably about 350 feet in from the portal, and it's just a straight shot. What I might do, I might turn off my light. You guys can see how dark it is in here with me, and uh, just pray that uh, I don't get hit by a bat. All right, give me a sec. All right, let's check this out. I don't know if the GoPro is going to pick up the portal. So a little beam of light up the end. How cool is that? Can you guys see that? Just that little pinhole of light? Right. It reeks in here. I am sweating buckets. I need to get out of here and get some fresh air. All right, guys, I've still got one more mine to show you. It is Kent's Knob. That is uh, just to our north. It's only meant to go in about 40 to 50 feet on our little mine maps. Not as cool as this one. Uh, so I might not film this. I'm not looking forward to the climb out. It's going to be really gross. See you guys on the outside. This is why you don't touch the back when you're squeezing through. Oh, brutal. All right. That was hectic. Oh, I need a break from damp, smelly air. I'm gonna go for a mission up that hill, show you guys what's up Mount Melville. Then I'm gonna hit the last one of the day. Then I'm gonna show you the township. Let's do it. Oh, it's good to be out of that uh, stuffy mine. Well, this is an interesting one, guys. I'm now on the uh, north eastern corner of Mount Melville and uh, staring at the little remains of an old silver mine uh, shaft. So if you guys could picture what it would have been like uh, when they found gold at Shamrock, there would have been a lot of activity, there would have been a lot of funding getting uh, siphoned into all the mining companies there. But if you guys could picture it all around the hills that surrounded this area, they would have been looking for where those reefs continued 
and they would have been just searching these hills frantically uh, looking for their own claim and uh, they actually hit really good gold here there's obviously not much left of this and confusingly there's almost no mullock heap at all uh, the only thing I can think of is that maybe it was down in the creek and it's all been washed away with all the floods over the years uh, but this one went down around about 60 feet and there was a drive at the bottom and from this mine here they ended up getting 11 ounces per ton of really high grade silver uh, so the name of this old beast is called the rose and thistle uh, silver mine so uh, I just needed some fresh air after that last little explore there's meant to be some smaller workings back up over the hill and then uh, that will be it guys I'll be us signing out from Shamrock still got to show you guys uh, the old township I'm gonna get some aerial footage of that as well uh, thanks very very much to our drone pilot for helping us out uh, with that it's going to really increase the production value of this uh what has been awesome adventure out this way hope you guys have enjoyed it well this looks like it's about the biggest shaft out here guys this is the mount melville uh old abandoned mine and you can see it's only a really small dump it doesn't always give away the size of the mine this was only exploratory so they bored this down until they hit the reef you can already tell there's already more rock taken out of there than what's there but because this was an exploratory shaft they're looking what values and whether it was feasible and worthwhile economically to keep mining probably the vast majority of this rock would have been taken away to be assayed so i think this one was meant to go down about eight meters down in the day Whew. if you actually look closely just the the hills gouged out absolutely everywhere it's all into sandstone and mud rock on this hill little trenches just absolutely everywhere another one over there all right we're running out of daylight so i'm heading over to kent's knob guys to show you that mine if we get into that that will be if it's still open that'll be the oldest gold mine that a we know of and b that we've ever had the ability to explore so looking forward to that one see you guys in a sec check out this old girl it's taken us months to get out here guys now this one's only meant to go back in about 50 feet but we're going to check it out anyway that's kent's knob so that was first blasted in 1887 it's gonna be really cool to go in there so what we we're talking about earlier this is where the old timers would have been panning frantically for gold one or two things may have happened here just speculation they would have either found a high concentration of gold or the gold would have stopped so they would have followed it up and they would have set charges and started blasting this one's really overgrown all right let's go get my light out turn my o2 meter on oh i've got something in here small timbers check the snakes oh i can already see the face spewing i have one million midges and i'm getting eaten alive can you guys hear that on the mic i'll just shut up for a sec all right i'm gonna mine spider got that smell of ammonia again and we have assay trays so i don't think this would have been from the old timers this would have been the more modern miners or the current lease owner that's in here sampling maybe chipping away a bit more of this material it's all just been left in here and i think if i'm not mistaken that's a core sample that's what they do the more modern miners don't have to chip away with all that expense they diamond drill look how smooth that is that's a core sample so they would have drilled into some of the walls around here and they let their big drill bits do all the work for them oh yeah faces out this is epic little three-way junction oh i'm getting weed on by moss and bats exploring abandoned mines is no fun we love it but it's pretty gross 
So right now, guys, I'm standing in a three-way junction in Kent's Knob, a mine that was first blasted almost 140 years ago. And that is the face. And that is also the face that may have kept going. It's been backfilled pretty well. Hello, Mr. Bats. Oh, they are micro bats. I hated those things when I first started exploring mines, but they are really cool. But you've got to watch out for them. Number one, it's their habitat. You've got to respect it. We've been in mines where it was just in, that infested with bats. Sorry, mate, I'm blinding you. We actually got scratched and bitten and I actually had some lodge in the back of my harness. So I went to the GP after doing a bit of homework and uh, the GP sent us to hospital and the hospital had to call the Queensland Department of Health for advice and we needed to get a immediate vaccine for Australian lysivirus. That's another thing with abandoned mines guys, you get scratched by a bat, you could end up with a Lysivirus, which is in almost 100% of cases fatal. All right, I've got to get out of here. I'll show you guys the old township. I'm going to try and piece together where the old pine tree was. Why am I standing in this mozzie pit? I've got to get out of here. Well, like I was just saying, we're going to try and piece together where the old township was. And uh, what's going to help us do that is an enormous pine tree uh, that was planted right on Main Street, which was where the township of uh, the original Mount Shamrock civilization lived. Let's go check that out. Well, we are making our way over to the old site, the old settlement. And this was also on our maps of this area. What does this you say? This is the old processing shed, all the foundations of it. So step number one at a gold mine is to take it to the assay office, have the geologist check out the, uh, the value. And if the operation was big enough, which it was at Mount Shamrock, once that uh, ore, once that gold, was out of the uh, leaching tanks and was in the form of an amalgam, it would uh, come down here and they would they'd process it, they'd fire it. They would heat off the uh, the mercury or the cyanide. Look how old the brickwork is in there, guys. How cool is that? And then the last step would be to fire it in the gold bars. So all the relics here indicate that this was a big operation at one point in time. All right, we're going to move our, our way over to the... Uh, so the old township guys, see if we can link up this uh, pine tree back to the old historic photos we've got of Main Street. So this guys is the same flight path we're about to take uh, as we launch the drone and do a bit of a flyover of the old townships. There's old school, post office, butchers, a uh, number of dwellings and I think the population out here got to around about the 200 and it was populated by these names. And if you know anything about Paradise Dam, which is probably going to be our next uh, adventure, a lot of these same surnames are featured heavily up in the township of Paradise. So what this footage is going to do, it's going to fly up and over the school to the middle of the township. And then we're going to uh, zoom up over the hill and show you guys the uh, number one shaft.
stop for a breather at the top of the hill to uh, take in the views out to the west towards uh, Mount Walsh. And we've got these two things. And these two things tell a story. They're claim posts. So we're on the northwestern corner. That would be one of the original miners' claims posts that they would have needed to peg out their claim. That looks extremely old. It's riddled with white ants. That's probably the original claim post. And I'd say this one's probably from the 80s. And they're just sitting side by side still today. That's really cool. So there'd be four of these on the property uh, to peg out the uh, claim. Really cool. Thanks so much for watching, guys. That is the story of Mount Shamrock. I hope you got to uh, stay with us for all three parts. So Shamrock, they first hit gold in 1886. I think by 1891 there was reports there were over 200 people living in the town. About 140 to 150 were miners. But it was actually the struggles of the town were attributed to the discovery of gold uh, in the Paradise Gold Fields in 1889. And that was uh, what was leading to the migration of the miners and their families uh, north and south to these two gold fields. Now, I do believe by about 1924, um, some of the township and some of the actual properties had migrated from Paradise back to uh, Mount Shamrock, including the Berries Pioneer Hotel. Uh, but I think they closed the school in about 1927, and that was pretty much the end for uh, Shamrock. Not necessarily the end for the mining. I think there was some still uh, some activity going on, uh, predominantly though just with the tailings and the uh, moving the tailings through cyanide tanks. Uh, whoop, that's me getting stuck on the fence. That was my only injury I sustained for the day. So guys, that was a pretty epic adventure. Uh, spanned across three episodes. Uh, we don't have anything planned um, for Queensland abandoned mines yet. Uh, this might be a good way to see it out for the year. That We don't know of too many locations that are as epic as this one. So thanks again to the property owners for giving us access. We really hope you enjoyed um, us sharing the story of Mount Shamrock with you all.